What's up, family? Thanks so much for joining us for our worship experience. We're so glad that you're part of our community today. Listen, here at Impact Church, we believe one person can impact many. So take a moment, start a watch party, hit like, subscribe, share, help us get the word out. And again, thanks so much for joining us and enjoy the word this morning. Give you today's notes and things that you can follow along. If you are not or you don't have a digital device, then you can join in with us to the book of Nehemiah, verse chapter 1. And we're going to go another further. I was preparing and I was thinking about where I saw us going today and um, in a movie that I think most of us have seen. It's, it's a little dated now, but it's worth bringing up. The Pursuit of Happiness back in 2006. Y'all remember that one? Yeah. And, um, well, you see Will Smith is, 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 is basically playing Chris Gardner and... Ooh, that member had a, some some bad breaks that happened to him. If you remember, the movie started off and he his marriage wasn't so wasn't so good, and he had a little I think five or six year old child and and all that kind of stuff, and and so he's pursuing something better than what he sees. And you may remember that um, he was a salesman. He started off as a salesman for some kind of next generation X ray machine that would scan the bone density of bones better than an X ray could ever do, and. Um, so on his way to wherever he was going, he was on his way someplace, and he's in a taxi cab, and you remember that scene with the Rubik's Cube? And I know he surprised me. I said, Will, how you do that? You know, but he wasn't Will, but anyway. Um, he got the Rubik's Cube down and all that, and so in the car, though, he's meeting a gentleman for the first time and talking to a gentleman who is a partner at Dean Witter and Reynolds' um, organization. And so he, the guy is just totally amazed by what he's able to do with the Rubik's Cube and that he's able to solve it. And so by solving it, he gets this invitation now to apply for this internship there as a stockbroker. Well, if you're at the bottom of the barrel and, and things aren't going too good for you financially and this opportunity comes, you're going to be pretty hopeful about it. So he's hopeful about it. He's getting himself together for it. But before he can get to that opportunity, he winds up with a little setback. He winds up uh, Police officers come and take him to jail for some outstanding tickets that he has. So then he's able to get up the next morning. He's able to go. He's not dressed correctly. He's dressed like he came out of jail. <laughs> and he still goes on the interview, and he, things begin to look like it's going okay, only to find out, though, that he's further set back because the position no longer, the position is not a paid position. So after realizing he's not getting a paid position, <laughs> he really begins to hit rock, rock bottom, bottom because in that Somewhere around that time, he loses his last piece of asset, I guess you could call it, his, his last scan of that's lost, so he's set back with that. His wife leaves him. That's a, a setback, so he's set back with that. The next thing that happens is he gets evicted from where he's, the apartment he's living in. He's set back with that. And so he's going through all these different setbacks. Watch this. Not while he's doing the wrong thing, but while he's doing the right things. He's trying to take care of his family. He's trying to get a job. He's trying to get back up on his feet. He's trying to make something of himself. He's trying to do all of that. And while he's trying to do all the right stuff, all the wrong stuff happens. And, and it begs a question for us because sometimes, you know, last week we talked about some of the setbacks we face may be things that related to things that we did that we could have done differently. They could be self-inflicted. So sometimes our decisions can set us back or uh, things that we do, our actions can set us back. But this is not the case here. And, and many times uh, we go into scenarios doing all the right stuff. And it's when we're doing the right stuff and we're hoping that we're moving towards a comeback in our life that oftentimes we get hit with another setback. And, and that begs the question is, what do you do when, when you're doing the right stuff and you hope for a comeback, but you keep hitting setbacks? And I'm talking to somebody here that says, you know what, I've been praying, 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 and look like the more I pray, the worse things get. I get another setback. I've been worshiping God and putting him first in my life. The more it look like I go to worship, the more I go to praise, the worse things are getting. I get another setback. I've been, I've been giving faithfully. I've been giving, but it looked like my finances, he said, he'll open up the windows of heaven, but it looks like the windows are closed because my finances keep hitting rock bottom. I'm trusting God for a comeback, but I keep getting hit with setbacks. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I remember when, um, after we first got married, when, um, whenever the Lord would use me to speak at church, I mean, every single time, without fail, every single time, without fail, that I would speak, no matter what it was, if I spoke publicly at the church, every single time I was sick immediately after. And that, you say, well, that's not a big deal. It is a big deal when you just started a new job two weeks earlier. <laughs> 
And I wouldn't just be sick for a day. I wouldn't just be sick for two days. I'd be sick for a whole week and miss a whole week's worth of work. It was already bad enough. My paycheck, I remember, was $120 a week. Yeah, y'all felt that one, huh? Yeah, he brought me from a mighty long way. Wasn't too hard to get, but anyway. So, but every, I mean, this went on for months. September, October, November, December. I was, it was so bad that when I would go to the doctor, they would just, they didn't even bother doing anything. They said, we're just going to give you more, more antibiotics. They said, but we got to change them up because your body's used to that one, so we got to shift to that one. I went through every antibiotic you could just about think of. I was living on antibiotics month after month after month after month. And it wasn't because I was doing anything wrong. Every time I would do what I knew I needed to do or what he would call me to do, it, it looked like that would be the time I would be set back. And I know what it's like, and I know that many of you, you've, you're doing what God wants you to do, and you know it. Or you've been in seasons of your life that you're saying, I know God has told me, he told me, some of y'all, God told me to move here. I've heard people even say this. God told me to move to Atlanta, and I know he led me, but every, ever since I've gotten here, it feels like I keep getting set back. But you know you're exactly where God told you to go. And so what do you do when you're facing those kind of setbacks? It's one thing to know that you ain't doing right and you get a setback. It's one thing to know that you squandered your money so you don't have enough money to pay your rent or your mortgage. That's one thing, but it's a whole other deal when you're saying, God, I'm living right. I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm being faithful. I'm being steadfast and unmovable. And every time I take this step and look like when I stand in your will, I get knocked down. Am I talking to anybody this morning? And so we're going to look at briefly this morning about that because there's something behind it. The first thing I want to say is let me just, I want you to notice how many people that resonated with. One of the reasons why it resonates with us, but we don't always see when we're the one in it, is that it is normal. Because if you don't understand that it is normal, you'll think that something abnormal has happened just to you. So I want to normalize the fact that just because you're doing the right stuff doesn't mean everything is going to be right that happens to you. Now, what I can tell you about the Scripture and about our God, he says that even all the bad stuff that happens to you, that I'll use all of that to work together for your good. All right? The second thing I want to say to you is that we're going to be looking at, at Israel again, and so we're doing something totally different in our I groups looking at different ones in the Bible, but we're specifically looking on Sunday mornings about Israel and following the journey that we started early in the, in the year with the rise. But Israel, you're going to find out, is back with doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're back in the land. You're going to find that they're back in covenant relationship with God. They're back in community. They're back in their temple and look like they have another setback. And so we're going to talk about this one. The one thing you must do since you are going to have, say with me, I will have setbacks. Since you're going to have setbacks, and if you need a scripture, in the world you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. How about that? In the world you're going to have some setbacks. So now, now that I know that, instead of being surprised, shocked, stunned, amazed, and knocked out of the battle or discouraged and wanting to give up, how do I respond when these setbacks come? Because you're going to find out that it's not the, always a setback that ultimately knocks you back, but sometimes it's how you respond to the setback that can ultimately knock you back. And so we're going to find out how we've got to respond if we want to get past those setbacks and get back into a place of a comeback. Y'all ready? All right. I'm going to fall asleep on y'all, so stay with me. Help him, Lord. Nehemiah chapter 1. It came to pass that Hannah and I, one of the brethren, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Now, do you, do you see a connection already from where we were last week? This is a continuation. And said to me, the survivors, any survivors in the house? The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province, and it's referring to Judah and Jerusalem, are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned. 
for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Now these are your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was a king's cup bearer. Let's talk a little bit. So last week, we talked about how Israel's own sin is what led them to their own setback. All year, I've been saying the same thing, that Israel's really the biggest sin. And I know we have, in our own mind as Christians, we have this tendency to categorize sin like, ooh, that's a really bad one over there. That one over there, not so much. That one right there, that's really bad. And God's like, mm, you know, sin is sin because I'm a holy God, right? And so no matter if I... if, if as an example, if a bride is wearing a white dress on her wedding day, it doesn't really matter if you get black on it or red. It's still bad. It's still a mark, right? And so God looks at sin, all sin, as, as, as something that brings a separation between us and a violation of his holiness. Well, anyway, you know that Israel, their biggest sin probably more than any other sin, the one we really don't talk a lot about in church, is the sin of idolatry. It is when we put something or someone, and it could be a person, place, a thing, or an idea above God or before God in our lives. And so Israel called into a covenant relationship with God and knows the Ten Commandments and knows that they are to have no other God beside me, chooses the pagan gods. And God says, as I told you before, he does what we call a spiritual timeout and says, you know what? You can cut up and be grown if you want to, but not in my house. You're going to have to get up out of this. You can act grown if you want, just not here. And so he, he gives them a spiritual timeout. And they go into exile, into Babylonian captivity. And so what you found out last week was that even when we do the things that God tells us not to do, and even when we, and all of us have, and even when we, as the scripture says, we miss the mark and all fall short of the, of the glory of God, when we miss it, that there's still grace. Somebody shout, there's still grace. So in the midst of that, at the front end, he says, I know y'all done messed up, and you're going to think that all hope is gone for you. So he tells them the scripture that a lot of church folk love but didn't know the context of. He tells them, I know what's going to happen to you, but know this. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you hope in the future, not to do any harm to you. So what he's saying to them is, in spite of you having to deal with the consequences of your sin, which is a setback that you're experiencing right now, I have not stopped loving you. And what you have done has not negated my plan. And then he tells them, the prophet tells them in Jeremiah, that it's going to be a, it's going to be a while. It's going to be like mm, a little few years, like 20, 30, 40, 70 years <laughs> in time out. It's, it's going to be a while. But when you feel hopeless, just remember that at the end of this, you're going to see, I like the song they sung this morning, I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land. Although you're going to see God's goodness. And so he says, you still have a hope, you still have a future. And so they're going through this exile, they're going through this massive setback for 70 years. And then, but here's the thing, when you get to year 65 and year 66, what was so negative and so hard and so harsh and so heavy, you start getting hope because you start saying, wait a minute, he told us we were going to be here. But guess what? We're getting ready to come out of this thing. Look at somebody say, I'm about to come out of this thing. So they're excited. God, they, didn't, they went to church that Sunday morning. Their pastor was preaching about a comeback. They're all excited. And all of a sudden, things change around them because, you know, God got to move a lot of things to work it out for you. You know that, right? When God works it out for you, he's got to change something else for somebody else, move something over here and connect this over here. He does a lot of legwork behind the scenes that we don't even see. So when God says, okay, I know the plan that I have. I'm going to shift some things around. I know the Babylonians are in charge of mm, the world right now, but let me shift that. And this is history, and I'm going to put the Persians in charge. They're going to defeat the royal power just because I got a plan for you. So he shifts it, and the Persians beat the Babylonians. And they allow Israel, just like the prophecy, to return back to their land. Can you imagine how excited they must have been? 
Can you imagine how thrilled? We're going back home. We're going back to our own place. We're going back to being under the sovereign rule of God. We're going back to a place that we can have our temple. We're going to see relatives and family and tribes that we have not seen in decades. We'll all be back together. Can you imagine how excited they were? They were hopeful for a comeback. They were excited about a comeback. And when they get there, yeah, you had a comeback, but not completely. Because now they get there, they got a lot of enemies. I'm just giving you some background so you can appreciate what's happening. So while the king is fine with them in general, all the other folks ain't too happy about them having to come back. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Everybody don't want to see you prosper. Everybody don't want to see you overcome. Everybody don't want to see you take the next step. Everybody don't want to see you go to the next level. And so, and so they, they, get their, they get their comeback, and all the little neighboring ones that are in the region start sending word back to to the king of Persia saying, hold up. I don't know if you know about these nuts over here, but these, they think they all that. We got history written about them. And what they do is, if you don't put a squash on them now, because they want to rebuild this wall, and they want to rebuild the gates that have been burned with fire, if you don't squash this now, this is what they told the king according to Ezra 4. You're not going to get your tax money. Because they have a history. They're not going to want to pay their taxes to you. And so they, they're fabricating and making things that really weren't true about them. And all it's doing is further setting them back. So fast forward to the text. So Nehemiah is in Persia, right? So that's out, outside of where Jerusalem and Judea is. And so his brother, his little blood brother, and some other brethren come, come through across the desert and come through town. And they find that Nehemiah is a cup bearer. Um, which means that what he does is he tastes the wine. Some of y'all would like that job. <laughs> you going to pay me to taste your wine? It tastes good. You know, we would. So, but his job was to taste it to make sure that the king wasn't being poisoned, which meant that if you are my cupbearer, it means that I trust you. So he's highly trusted. He's not a civic leader like, like Daniel and other ones and Joseph. He's, he's just in the king's palace, and he's a cupbearer. And so his brethren come to town. He says, whew, how are little folk doing at Impact Jerusalem? <laughs> They've been hearing about a comeback for a long time, and they got the message and, and how things going for them. And they say, oh, brother, it ain't going as good as you may think. He said, what are you talking about? Because I know the Lord had a plan for them, and the prophet spoke about it. And he opened up the door for them to come back to their homeland. And, they, and we know that there's mass exodus. And I think this is like the third group of exiles, the third wave that got back into the city, into Jerusalem. What do you mean it's not going good? He said, hold up. He said, he said the wall is broken down. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us, but it means a whole lot when the walls will protect you from the enemy. The gates are burned with fire, another opening for the enemy to get into, destroy you. And the people there are in reproach and shame and disgrace. And so essentially what he's saying to Nehemiah, it's not going good that, that even though they hoped for a comeback, they just hit another setback. And I'm talking to somebody this morning that you've been hoping for a comeback, but you've hit another setback. And here's the thing. Last week, there was not where they needed to be. This week, they're back in covenant. They're back in the will of God. They're back in the promised land. They're doing everything God told them to do, and yet they're still set back. Who am I talking to this morning? They're doing what they were called to do, but in the midst of it, there's this thing that keeps happening to them that they're further set back. And so I'm just going to say this brief part because this, this part here is new to me. I didn't realize when I read Nehemiah, I read it many times, that this is not from captivity. This is not like somebody came in and, 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 and broke down the wall to Babylonians. This was new news. Somebody say new news. How do you know, Pastor? Number one, Ezra chapter 4 gives a lot of signals to it. And, and by the way, Ezra and Nehemiah at one point was really one book, Ezra and Nehemiah, okay? So they complement each other. The second thing is that uh, is by Nehemiah's response. If this had happened earlier from captivity, then he would not have been surprised. You know how you know something already? It ain't no surprise. But then you go home, you already know what's already wrong. 
Then you go home and something else goes wrong, or then you go get in your car and now another part breaks down. It's like it's new news, and you can tell by your response. Nehemiah is is stunned. He has no idea that he's thinking his people are fine because he knows that they're back there, only to find out that what was built up had been destroyed and that they had been set back. And, and what I notice here, this is the part I want you to capture. What you don't see here that you find out later is that it wasn't just any king who had stopped the building. So let, let's, let me go back and be real clear here. The enemies were going back to the king and putting political pressure on the king. Don't let these fools build because they're going to think they're all that and they're going to, you're not going to have control over them. Finally, the king gives into political pressure and stops the building. They stop the building. Um, and so the people of Israel living behind broken down walls, broken down gates, and in reproach. Are you with me? Okay. Nehemiah says, hold up. How did this happen? He comes to find out that it's not just any king. Guess what? It's the king he's serving wine to. Ooh, it's getting good. Mm, mm. Can you imagine that you think that the king, mm, can you imagine that you think that your boss got your back and that your boss is in your corner only to find out behind your back your boss is sending you back? Come on, somebody. Your boss is getting in the way of that promotion. Your boss is smiling in your face. You don't know that behind your back, your boss is pushing you back. He, he comes to realize that the one he's serving wine to is the same one that's setting his people back. Oh, God, it just reminds me a little bit of when Miss Seely found out it was Mr. and not Nettie. And it wasn't nitty. Don't act like y'all don't know. <sighs> y'all remember that. And she's standing there. Later on, we find that she's, she's shaving Mr. And that, mood, that music start kind of picking up some. And she... Don't do it. See, that would have been me. Hey. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> he finds out that it's his boss. And so, and what I like about this part is, while I joke there, right, I know that's an extreme one, but I know in our own lives when, when things happen, especially when there's people involved that set us back, and you find out that it's somebody that you know. I know a lot of times, if it's up to us, there's, there's something in us that says, I, I want to get even with you, or I'm going to give you a piece of my mind, or I'm going to make you suffer for that, or, or you, I'm going to put some revenge back on you. Y'all ain't going to say nothing, but, but th there's a reason why Nehemiah doesn't do that. And I'm going to tell you what the, 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 what the reason is, because by this point, the Bible says that after he snotted, after he cried, after he was so upset, after he was so disillusioned, he prayed. He prayed. And so let me tell you what prayer does. Prayer is the thing that prepares you for a comeback. Because as long as I respond the way I would respond, as long as I respond the way flesh would respond, I will be ultimately be, be, I will ultimately be at fault for my own ultimate setback. Because as long as I walk in unforgiveness, it's me setting me back. As long as I walk in bitterness, it's me setting me back. As long as I'm seeking revenge, it's me setting me back. As long as I have hatred in my heart, it's me. It's not what you did. It's my response to the setbacks in my life determine my comeback. Oh, that was good right there. How you respond. Because since I told you in the beginning that we needed to normalize setbacks, even for people of God, even for people of faith, even for people that are doing what they're supposed to do, even for people who are walking in righteousness, well, then what happens? Well, then what happens is my response to how I'm set back determines if I get a comeback or not. It's not what your enemies do. Your enemy can't stop you from coming back. Your neighbor can't stop you from coming back. 
Your distant relative can't stop you from coming back, but you can stop you from coming back. I can stop me from coming back. But we've got to get on our face and pray because prayer prepares your heart for the comeback. Never. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Your initial response to the setback that you face is human. You know, he, he bawled. I mean, he bawled. This was for them. They don't have, you know, the news stations that you have and the internet. So when somebody comes and carries news, that was the evening news. And he got the evening news that not just his family, including his brother that was there, but all the tribes that came hoping for a comeback got hit with a setback. But what we know is this, that before you do anything, you got to stop and pray. Why? Because your initial response is, is, is human to, to mourn and to grieve and to be upset. And even the Bible says be angry but sin not, right? So the response, the initial response is fine. But a lot of times before we, uh, a lot of times we will go take an action before we pray. And that is out of order. So if, if I commit the action before I pray, I'm going to mess it up. Y'all know how you, I should have. Should have filed my first mind. What did your first mind tell you to do? <laughs> That's what I want to know. I had a neighbor boy. Oh, I can write a book on this one. But I had a neighbor who, whoo, mm, her response is, boy, was something. You crossed her? She, you know, she was the kind of person, she said, I ought to put x lax in the gravy. You had a whole nother level. I wouldn't even thought of that one. <laughs> My parents like, uh, when you go trick-or-treating, <laughs> skip their house. <laughs> True story. <laughs> True story. But we often, we will act first and then pray. We'll make a decision first and then pray. And, usually, and, and then when we, the action and the decision, and then we pray after, is usually a prayer, watch this, that God blesses what I already did. Y'all ain't saying nothing with me. I need somebody who's going to be real. I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to do this. Now, Lord, bless it. But what Nehemiah shows us is that if you want a comeback and you want to be ready for that comeback in your life that God wants to give you, you've got to pray first and then act after. Pray first, then make the decision after. Or else you'll be Miss Sealy spitting in the water behind in the kitchen. But that'll set you further back. So prayer prepares you for a comeback. How does it do that? The first thing it does is it reminds you that God is still on the throne. Because can you imagine this man? So the king is the most powerful person in the world, certainly in that nation, but because they just took out the most powerful empire, he's the most powerful person in the world. So I'm serving the most powerful person in the world, and I can't get anything to change. The only way they're going to be able to continue rebuilding the wall and, and get them back to a sense of community that they had before the exile is if that man gives them the go-ahead. In other words, there's some things in our life, there's some things in our comeback that will never happen without somebody, watch this, who is in authority giving us the green light. Which means that it's out of my hands. I can't, if the judge doesn't give the green light, I can't fix it. Come on, somebody. If, if the doctor doesn't tell me I can come off the medication, I can't come off. If, if somebody in authority does not give me the green light, I can't change anything. And so when the person in authority look like they're working against you, you can do like, like Nehemiah did and say, oh, great God. 
start remembering that even though king, this king might be big, God is bigger. Even though this king might be great, God is greater. Even though I got a challenge with this king, God is bigger than any challenge that I face. Prayer reminds you that God is still on the throne. Because when you get hit with a setback, we have spiritual amnesia. We forget that God is still on the throne. You get a doctor's report, you forget God is still on the throne. Your child gets a failed report in school, you forget in that moment God is still on the throne. You get your taxes to do, but you don't have enough money, you forget in the moment God is on the throne. But when you go and pray, when you fall on your knees, when you lift your hands, when you begin to say, tell God who he is, it reminds you that God is still on the throne. And there's no vacancy in the Trinity. He don't need you. He don't need me. He don't need us. He's got everything under control. He's got the whole world in his hands. Because when I forget that God is still a throne, I get to meddle in myself. <laughs> now, if I can move this over here and take half of that over here, don't act like y'all know what I'm talking about, and put that together with this over here, and then get him to do this over here, and ask her to do it over there, and then do that. And don't forget to ask God to bless it. I can work it out. But when you pray, you have less of a need to, pay, to play God. Because every time I try to get control in my life, and every time I try to do it my way, it's me trying to play God. Which is the main reason that got me in the mess I'm in anyway half of the time, because they came out of exile, because they wanted to be God in their own lives and putting things before them. So it reminds you that God is still on the throne. Secondly, it renews your hope. Because when you get set back, after set back, after set back, it's easy to lose hope. I remember when I was sick, I was, am I always going to be like this? When they can't tell you what's wrong with you, that was probably the worst part, not knowing what it was. I'm like, and I went to all the different doctors and you name it, and I had uh, probably one, 102, 103 fevers and headaches and couldn't move, and it was just a big, and no one could tell me what it was. So I would go to the next doctor, and we had a, um, an HMO, um, it was called HIP, it was in New York, and um, when I would, anytime I was sick, it was a guarantee whenever you call HIP, you was going to be on a hole on the phone for two hours. Well, if I, if I could be on the phone for two hours, I wouldn't be sick. And so, and so you start, it's easy to feel hopeless. It's easy. You know, I was young. I was newly married. I was home on Friday night sick most of the time. And so it's easy to feel like, will things ever change? You know, I had, you name it, I had them pray for me. Nothing, nothing worked. And then finally one day, um, I went, and I had already gone to different ones, but I went to this one lady. She was an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And it was the simplest thing you ever want to see. I could have smacked all the other doctors, but you didn't hear from me. Um, she said, she, she said, we don't believe in violence. But anyway, I could, so I said, um, she said, oh, you got bad tonsils. I said, it took you all nine months to figure out I got bad tonsils. But I was grateful. I said, what we got to do, you got to get them out when. Yeah, we got them out. <laughs> Thank you. You feel that? And as simple as that was, that's exactly what happened. But they were so bad to me when I woke up after the surgery, the doctor said, and y'all stay with me, hope you to eat. She said, <laughs> she said, your tonsils were the most disease I've ever seen. I said, well, thank you. She said, they just fell apart. Just like, I don't even know how to describe how she described it to me, but that's how bad they were. You good? No more descriptions? Did I set you back? And so when you're in those scenarios, it's easy to think that God isn't always going to be like this. I'm talking to somebody this morning. And if you're not careful, you'll lose hope, and you will watch this. You will make a, a permanent home out of a temporary place. You will begin to convince yourself it will always be that way. 
Now, notice last week, I call out something last week specifically when I was reading Jeremiah 29, going into verse 11. But right before that, when Israel was going into exile, I said, isn't this kind of strange that God would tell them, oh, by the way, plant gardens. Y'all remember that one? Marry, marry women, have children, give, give your children, help give them spouses to the other children, let them have children. What he was saying to them then is, you're going to live here for a while. But he didn't say that to them in this situation. And we have to be careful that we're not putting down permanent roots in a temporary place. Because you'll, trans, you'll transcribe or bring that other experience into this current context, and you'll start convincing yourself that you're hopeless, it's never going to get better, it's only going to get worse, it never works out for me. I'm talking to somebody, uh, and and I'm going to be stuck here, but the devil is a liar. I know a God that's able to renew your hope, to renew your strength, to renew new life, and still able to deliver you, and still able to give you a comeback. And that's what prayer does. Because the minute you open your mouth, Watch this, you're stepping out of you. The minute you say, oh God, you shift the focus from you. And your hope now is in him and not in yourself. You ain't even asking that. Oh God, you're only looking. That's what I will look toward the hills. I ain't even opened my mouth yet. For whence cometh my help? Knowing that my help cometh from the Lord. The minute you do that, what you're really saying is, I know hope is I know help is coming. I know deliverance is coming. I know peace is coming. I know I'm gonna be set free. It's coming. I know provision is coming. Because why? I will lift my eyes to the hills. And the last thing prayer will do for you is it releases God's hand. He ends off chapter 1 saying, oh, let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man because I know who you made me. I am the king's cup bearer. You'll find that in the next chapter, he's about to take action. And, and so, and here's the thing, because see, I need to go back a bit when I talked about some of us do stuff and then we pray, Right? And it needs to be we pray first. But some of us only pray. That's not good. Because faith without works is what? And so it's not just enough to stop with praying. There's often an action that you must take. And so the rest of Nehemiah, and we'll be looking at that, doesn't stop with him praying. It starts with him building the foundation of prayer into his life for the comeback because there's also going to be actions he will take while he's expecting God to take action. And that's what prayer does. It releases God's hand to the action. Essentially what he's saying is, take me, where's Tamala at? Take me to the king. Write this down. Prayer is the bridge between a setback and a comeback. And you need to become familiar with the bridge because you'll cross it many times. But it is the bridge between a setback and a comeback. It is the bridge. It bridges both between a setback and a comeback. It's always the bridge between a setback and a comeback. If you were to ask Daniel, he would tell you that prayer was the bridge between my setback and a comeback. If you ask Esther facing annihilation of her people, it was prayer. Three, we call it Esther, Esther fast, but that, she, she just did it three days and three nights. Prayed, and it became a bridge between a setback and a comeback. And Jesus says to Peter, he says, um, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, you got the wrong IP address. That's for somebody. That must be John or James. He says, no, no. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> he, said, he said, but I have prayed for you that when you're a setback, your faith doesn't fail you. And so we read, we read about Peter's comeback in a profound way because that everybody that walked with Christ, despite his great setback, he is the one who preaches on the day of Pentecost. He is the one who preaches and 3,000 souls are added to the church. He is the one that sees the Holy Ghost come down on the, on, the, on the 120. He is the one that God uses because despite the setback, it became a setup for a comeback when you pray. It is a bridge between a setback and a comeback. And what I know about prayer is either prayer changes your situation or it changes you for the situation. But either way, prayer changes things. Y'all coming up, we're going to get ready to worship. I want you to know 
I've seen what God can do. I've seen it. Uh, you know, I, wouldn't, I can't, personally, I can't preach something passionately that I have not experienced. And some of you this morning, you're like Nehemiah. Because actually, Nehemiah had a pretty good. Nehemiah was living in the palace. He had a really good job. But he was praying for people that he loved that had a setback. And some of you, you're praying for loved ones, children, spouse, parents, neighbors, coworkers that have had a setback. And what I know is that when you begin to pray, and even when you intercede for other people, God begins to move and release his hand to move on their behalf. We had a young, well, not him, actually, maybe three weeks ago. It could have been four, but first of all, people would never know during this pandemic how many people have been touched. And we're going to open this up to you in, um, in the future, in the near future, prayer at the altar again. But how many people have been touched in the foyer? We have prayed people into salvation in the foyer. People have been healed in the foyer. About three weeks ago, a couple, they're not even members that have been here more than once, said, would you please pray for our son? He's in his early 20s, and I forget the, con the name of the condition, but he needs a new heart. And so the first time they came, they would believe in God that he would even be allowed to be on the list. The last time they came, he's been sick for over a year, really sick. Um, the last time they came, they said, please pray that God opens up, the, opens up the way for him to have a heart. And we know that even in that, that that means somebody else doesn't make it. Please pray for them. And we did. To their surprise, on Valentine's Day, this past Monday, they got a call. Their son is in North Carolina. You need to get up here right now. He's got to have the surgery today. There's a heart for him. <laughs> Twelve hours later, he was in surgery and is doing just wonderful. That was not supposed to happen like that. It was not supposed to happen that quick. It was even a, a, a great feat just for him to get on the list. I know when we pray. I know what God can do. I know when we pray for other people. Some of you struggle. You're praying for loved ones, children, your parents. I, I'm a witness of what God can do when you pray for the people you love. And in a minute, we're going to do that. We also brought today with us, it's just appropriate. We've been praying over the cards you submitted, and just thank you for your trust. Um, but we've been praying over these cards. Some of them came in online. Your prayer request during this time of comeback. But I want you um, to prepare your heart to agree with us in prayer in a few moments. Because I just believe... Not everything is going to happen in the next six weeks, but I just believe a lot is going to happen in the next six, six weeks. And I believe there's going to be a lot of testimonies in the next several weeks. And just like the one we just told you, I believe there's others on the way. But I also know that he looks for us to partner with him. And when we open our mouth and when we pray, we partner with what God wants to do. He begins to do it. Amen. They're going to minister a song, and then after we're going to pray. How about that? I want you all to stand on your feet and worship with them and let them... Tomorrow, so keep praying, keep praying. 